here that's going to happen is that Jesus is going to be conceived. And you all know the story. Mary's minding her own business. And the same <coughs> angel that told Zechariah and Elizabeth that she was going to have a baby um, came to tell Mary that she was going to have a baby. And, of course, his name was Gabriel. Oh, by the way, let's see. Oh, we have time. Um, you know, the funny thing is, I said a couple of weeks ago, the only creatures I know in the Bible that actually got credit for having wings are cherubs, but we always give angels wings. And um, this is probably why. Let's spell it. This is the Greek way. Remember, I'm not using Greek letters, but <laughs> trust me. This is the word for, the Greek word for an angel, angelos. I know it has two Gs, but they say angelos. And all it means is messenger. And anytime God sends a messenger, anytime God sends an angelos to, to speak to somebody, the thing is, is that there are regular messengers in the Bible, like, like King David would send a messenger somewhere. And, and that would be in Greek, it would be an angel. An angel went to deliver a message to somebody. That's not a heavenly angel, which is why the Bible is always careful to say, an angel of the Lord appeared to Mary. So I say, this is not just a messenger. This is a messenger of the Lord. And he even said the same thing in Hebrew. Um, the word for a, um, a messenger, I think, is malak, if I remember right. And, and, they would, and, and there would be just a malak would bring you a message, but the malak Elohim would be the messenger of God come to bring you a message. And so that's why angels colloquially are always illustrated with wings. But the thing is, remember, there's that famous Greek fellow that had like little wings on his feet and little wings on his helmet. And, you know, well, he's an angel too, make-believe angel. But he's still an angel. And so that idea of, of winged messengers coming down is a way of identifying that, yeah, the messenger came down from heaven. So the angel Gabriel came down and visited Mary. And he said, oh, you know, you're, you're so fabulous, darling. Y'all got big, God's got big plans for you. And, of course... She says, how's, it, how's this going to be? Because I've had no relations with a man. And the angel said, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the most, probably most high will ever shadow you, just like we talked about last week. Now, and by the way, um, in that kind of passage, it says the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the probably most high will overshadow you. It doesn't say the Holy Spirit will overshadow you, although the Holy Spirit does because it's implicit in the fact that the, that the Holy Spirit has got wings, so that the Holy Spirit, if he comes upon you, he is de facto overshadowing you with his wings. So, anyway, now, one of the cool things about that is that not only was Mary overshadowed by God the Father, she was also overshadowed by the Holy Spirit, which was that covenantal relationship. Now, we have to draw a little picture of Mary. Let's see, Mary is in a fabulous mood. Here she is. She is so pretty. Cute. Got a cute little nose. Anyway, and now Mary's sitting there and she's kind of in this really good mood because look. Here she is. <laughs> there is Mary. And look, that's Jesus. Little Zygote Jesus. Now, now it's time for comparison. Let's go back and remember. Let's, let's put the ark back where it belongs. And the ark is full of God's stuff, and we've already enumerated the three things I don't want to draw again. Now, there's the ark of the old covenant. This is the ark of the new covenant. Now, you tell me. The short answer of what's in here, this is God's stuff. Now, the trick question is, what's in here? No. God. God is in here. God's stuff is in here. So you tell me, which one of these two containers is going to be more important to God? Mary's going to be infinitely more important to God because this is just a bucket of stuff. He even got carried away by the Babylonians. Oh, it was unfortunate, but it wasn't the end of the world. Oh, but Mary, Mary is a whole different deal because she doesn't, this ark has got God himself growing in her, entirely different. But, tell me this, this ark, which one, uh, let's, let's go back again, is, could you touch this ark? No. no. Remember one poor fellow touched it. What happened to him? Yeah. A chair walked his head off or something. Yeah. You don't get to touch the box with God's stuff in it. Now, if you think being killed because you touched that ark would get you in trouble with God, that's how serious the penalty was. How serious a penalty would it be to touch this ark? It would be much worse. My guess is that Joseph, having been having had things explained to him by Gabriel, would have in some intuitive way recognized the arcness of Mary and would never have presumed to have been intimate with her. I don't 
something that would even have occurred to Joseph. I mean, even me, I think in, in my case, if, if my wife had had an angel appear to her and tell she was going to have a baby and all this kind of stuff, and then an angel told me to, to in a dream to relax, don't divorce, and all this kind of stuff, and this revelation occurred, I don't know that even after Jesus was born, I'd think, okay, baby, I've been waiting. Now it's my turn. No, 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 no. No, the ark is, is forever reserved for, for God himself. Now, this is kind of sweet, is that, of course, Jesus gets bigger and bigger. Here, wait. Okay. Here's little baby Jesus a few months later. Uh, there he is. Okay. There's, and then you got the umbilical cord. All right. Now, so, does Jesus breathe for himself? No. No. Does he eat for himself? No. No, but Jesus has to void. How does that, that, that just fill up? Right. Who... For, for every single thing about little baby Jesus, who does he depend on? Mary. He depends on me for every single thing. And it's this marvelous, marvelous humbling thing. Humbling thing, I think, is so sweet about this, is, is, that, is that there's this great saying in Greek. And you can see um, there are icons that cover this. Plotty, terra, ton, P-O-N. Mm, not never enough room. Uranon. Platyterra ton uranon. Platyterra means the breadth, like plat, like the Platte River, or flat. That's that's a common root. Many European root means broad, and this is more or less than. And uranon is the heavens, and it's there are these there are these beautiful icons. Well, you'll you'll have Mary, and she's got her arms out like this, and there'll be a little baby Jesus kind of sitting here like that, and that's called the Platyterra because it's saying that Mary was was broader than all the heavens to contain the immensity of God in, in her womb. This com always compels me to think how much God, how much Jesus loved us to condescend to camp out and grow and be utterly dependent on just, just this, this regular old sweet young woman. I just I never find it. Never fails to, to be compelling to me. Now, there's some interesting similarities between this arc and this arc. I'm not going to go into it exhaustively. Um, but the way the New Testament was written about Mary is apparently deliberately intended to recall things about, about this ox so that nobody fails to make the connection between the two. For example, both of the ox made a, made a little trip and, and came into Jerusalem later and all this kind of thing. And that remember when David first brought this ox into Jerusalem, he leapt and danced. And when, when Mary went to visit her sister Elizabeth, who had little John grown in her tummy, Little John left like David did when, when the ark came close to him. So there's a lot of, a lot of um, relationship between the two that's, that's fairly explicit in the Bible. So I mean, if, if Catholics sit here and say, you know, Mary's the ark of the new covenant, they didn't pull that out of a hat. That, that's just part of the warp and weft of, 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 of the, the worldview of the Bible. Now, let's see. There are all kinds of all kinds of cool stuff about that. Some of those guys here. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, here's another one too. Is that you know that had some bread in it? That had the, the manna bread, miraculous bread, and of course inside Mary the ark is the bread of life. Okay, I'm not going to go on in depth because we do have to. We have limited time. Unlimited material, limited time. It's a terrible problem. Oh, uh, let's see. Now, now I have to kind of jump ahead a little bit. It's kind of tricky. Is we're going to jump ahead to the last ark. In the, in the Bible, which is in the book of Revelation. Let's see. Now remember what happens in the book of Revelation is all kinds of spectacular stuff which we don't really care about because it doesn't have much to do with salvation history. Weird creatures, you know, with all kinds of eyeballs and teeth and bad stuff happens and we have no time for that. Instead, we're going to get to the important part. Remember over here we started off when we were eating and things were really swell. And then we went through a time when maybe things weren't so swell and everybody cried. <laughs> but then... At the second coming, we're all going to live in New Jerusalem, which is as swell as it could possibly be. Now, what's interesting about this New Jerusalem is that one of the first things that happens is God, Jesus comes down physically, and uh, it says that I saw a large white throne and someone was sitting on it. The earth and the sky fled from his presence. There was no place for them. I saw the dead, the great and the lowly, standing before the throne, and scrolls were opened. And the dead were judged according to their deeds. And then, and then all the dead, these are people that have drowned, I think. Uh, and then the sea gave up its dead. And death and Hades gave up. And then, so if you're in hell, you get out and you get matched up with your body again because it was just your soul at that point. 
And it says they were judged according to their deeds. I have to digress a little bit. Terrible, terrible translation. Deeds? No, 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 no. The right word for this is works. Yeah, this is like, this, the, the Greek word for this is ergon, which is like the word we have, energy. Ergon means work. And so when the Bible talks about good works, you have to do good works, or, or, or some works are useless, or this or that about works, they're always using that Greek word ergon, which is like an energy. When we talk about energy, it's just the capacity for work. It's almost a direct translation. Um, the funny thing is, is there are a lot of Bible translations, like especially the New Inter International Version. Anytime the word ergon is translated in that, in that Bible as, 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 as work, it's when works are bad. But any time works are good in that Bible, they won't say works. They'll say something like deeds. They'll, they won't say Abraham was justified by, by his works. Oh, no, no, no. That would make works look good. They'll say Abraham was justified by what he did. It's like, where do you get off? So anyway, this is the New American Bible. This is a Catholic Bible. It just bugs me to death that they say deeds. I know that's easier. It's like easier to say work sounds kind of old-fashioned. But then you, you lose the compelling fact when people come to you and say, you Catholics think that you can do good works and that's going to get you to heaven. Say, well, it does actually say you know, that you're going to be judged by your works. It must matter more than nothing. Anyway, so everybody gets judged by their works. And all the bad people go to hell. And all the good people live in, in the New Jerusalem. Now I have to draw a picture of planet Earth. One of the things that happens is, is the old... The old earth and the old heaven were swept away, and there was a new earth and a new, a new heaven. Oh, it's so wonderful. And God, he says, behold, God's dwelling is with the human race. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And let me find this. And then, here's planet earth. Let's draw a picture of this. There's planet earth. This is the new earth. And now we have to see what the new Jerusalem looks like. It says this. The one who spoke to me held a gold measuring rod to measure the city. The city was square. Its length, the same as its width. He measured the city with the rod and found it 1,500 miles in length and width and height. So this new Jerusalem is the same in width and length and height, which makes it what? It makes it a cube. And this cube is like, you know, it, it, it's a big old thing. I mean, it's something like, like that big sitting on planet Earth. You well, know, 1,400 miles, that's 8,000 8, in diameter, 1,400 tall. The cool thing about it is is that the New Jerusalem is a kind of an ark. It's a box, a container. You're going to live in it. And it relates back to this cube in Solomon's temple. And the thing is, is now is that all of us will be living in the ark with Jesus. It's so nice because ever since Eden, when they sinned, and then the human beings have been looking in arks for thousands and thousands of years, saying, oh, my life is ruined. If only I could be in that nice ark where everybody is good and everything is pleasant. And at the end of time, everybody is permanently hanging out with Jesus in that gigantic ark. And that would be the, the last ark of the Bible. But between those arcs, there's an intermediate arc which says a lot about the Catholic Church because the Catholic Church actually is playing an active role in salvation history. Over here, let's see, here's Mary. This is going to be the link. There's Mary. She's still happy. Maybe she's, maybe she's kind of pretty, a little prettier than usual. There you go. Okay. The pretty hair. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's enough for Mary. Take my word for it. Put in the M, not Moses. Mary. Now, Mary had baby Jesus. Mary Jesus came out. He was crucified. He eventually went off to heaven. Now, when Jesus went off to heaven, that's when kind of when the church got found, right? The Acts of the Apostles, Pentecost Sunday. Go out and make disciples of all nations. That's when we started having a pilgrim church. And the pilgrim church goes on this journey that has a direction that goes and goes and goes and goes until, boom, you get to the New Jerusalem, at which point we don't need a church anymore. So in between here and in between here is the Catholic Church doing the spade work, maintaining the continuity of this arcaness of salvation history. And the way the Catholic Church does that is we have a tabernacle in every Catholic Church, and we'll have a tabernacle in every Catholic Church until the end of time. And who lives in that, who lives in that tabernacle? Jesus is still, still living with us was alive in Mary's tummy. He was alive when he went around driving everybody crazy in the Holy Land. At the time, he, by the time he went to heaven, he had already established how he would physically still be with us. Here's a trick question: um, Was God with Moses? It's not. It's easy. Yes. Okay. Was God with Abraham? Yeah. Yeah. Was God with Isaiah? Yeah. Was God with Zechariah? Yeah. Was God with all those people? Yeah. Sure. Sure, he was with them. Yeah. Now remember, but that God didn't have a body, but he was with them spiritually. Now, 
Um, let's see. Remember, one of the last things Jesus said to his, to his apostles before he rose, ascended into heaven, he said, Behold, I'm with you always, even until the end of time. And I always thought, well, so what's the big deal? God's been with people all the time anyway. Why are you saying this? And I think Jesus is meaning something different. He's saying, my, the big deal about me, about Jesus, I'm here body and soul for you. Remember, you, you humans with your bodies and souls can access the fullness of, of God through my body and spirit. And when I say that I'm going to be with you always, I mean I'm going to still be with you physically because that's kind of the point of me having come down here in the first place. And the way that that is fulfilled is in the Catholic Church where Jesus set it up at the Last Supper where the bread and wine become Jesus' body and blood, soul and divinity, and he lives, he dwells with his people all the way from the moment of the founding of the church all the way to the end of the church. And I mean, I, you know, at this little juncture, I have no idea what happens, but in some, in some kind of way there's going to be some transition from Jesus dwelling under the appearances of bread and wine in, in churches to being, I don't know what, reconstituted with his, with his body and soul and hanging out with us with our body and souls. I never, I always like that, can't overemphasize that too much. It's like this, even though people don't think about it, that's like the definitive arc of the whole story for us is Jesus being living in there. And remember now, <coughs> we, we, don't, we don't call that an arc. And remember, we don't call this an ark. I, I remember we had a different term for Mary, she has the length. Because Mary is not full of God's stuff. Mary's full of God. Actually, Mary is more like a tabernacle of the Lord, a little house because Jesus dwelled in her. The same way that Jesus dwells in here. You wouldn't call that an ark. That's for God's stuff. No, this is a tabernacle, a little house, a little tent. And that's where he lives with his people and dwells with us until he gets to this point. Um, ooh, I think I may be done. It's like two minutes early. Um, got any questions? <laughs> Ooh, see, I'm learning how, learn how to get it done before that, before that thing kicks over to its third other business. Oh, here we got time for a little prayer. This is what we do at the Sunday school. It's real short because I was always hog up all the time. Um, and when we end the classes, I say, praise be Jesus Christ. And then y'all say, now and forever. So we're going to try that now. Ready? Praise be Jesus Christ. Yeah. Now and forever. Okay, now I'm going to do it again where you really yell like sixth graders. Praise be Jesus Christ. Yeah. Now and forever. Oh, that was spectacular. Okay, that's a perfect way to end the class. See you all next week if this wasn't too dreadful for you. And um, next week's going to be the six, the six miracles that make the miraculous food pyramid. Okay, see you all. <laughs>